السلام عليكم عليكم السلام عليكم السلام ورحمة الله Welcome everyone to our academic activity for today. Today we have two uh, important presentations. Uh, the first one will be about aortic uh, root surgeries. Will be presented by Dr. Uh, Zuhair Al Halis, and the second lecture about aortic valve replacement with mechanical prosthesis by Dr. Abdul Badi Abdulis. We have a guest consultant with us today, Dr. Muhammad Rafai, who is a cardiac surgery consultant from King Faisal Specialist Hospital in Jeddah. Fortunately, Dr. Halis just called now. He said he will, he will be delayed for some time because he just finished his uh, surgery. So just confirming the timing with him and we'll come back to you. So Dr. Halis will be with us around 
Uh, so we'll come back at 1.30. Sorry for the delay.
السلام عليكم Can you hear me? Alaikum salam, Luayn. Welcome to our, welcome back to our academic activity. So I believe we can start now. I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Zuhair Al-Halis, who will join, will join us today. Dr. Al-Halis doesn't need an introduction. He's a well-known uh, figure of cardiac surgery, both in, uh, locally and internationally. So I would like to thank him for joining us today and giving us this precious time of his time. And without further ado, Dr. Halis, the mic is yours. Assalamu alaikum, good afternoon. Alaykum can you uh, see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, aortic root uh, surgery this afternoon. Uh, you know, I mean, you can see it, the title here is in children, uh, but it also applies for uh, actually just the pathologies in children, but the whole principle applies for uh, uh, basically uh, all age groups. So <clears throat> the need actually in children, uh, as they are children, is, is really not that common. However, in patients with uh, congenital heart disease, dilatation of the aorta is a frequent feature at presentation and during follow-up after surgical interventions. We can see uh, aortic dilatation in many congenital heart defects. We can see it in coarctation of the aorta. We can see it in patients uh, with bicuspid aortic valve, particularly if they have uh, aortic valve stenosis. Then also it's seen in contrunkal abnormalities, uh, such as with tetralogy of fellow pulmonary atresia with ventricular septal defect and truncus arteriosus. Uh, and actually, because of all these uh, pathologies, a new uh, kind of entity <clears throat> has appeared in literature. It's called the uh, aortopathies. Uh, this is just collectively uh, uh, gathers all uh, these patients with abnormal aortic walls that may lead uh, to dilatation. Uh, we can also see the dilatation in some genetic syndromes with connective tissue disorder, such as the Marfan syndrome, uh, Lewis Dietz, uh, Elif Danlos, and also Turner uh, syndrome. You can see here in this uh, uh, CT scan in a patient uh, with pulmonary atresia on your uh, the A panel with pulmonary atresia and ventricular septal defect, and you can see that the ascending aorta is significantly dilated. Uh, the same you can see in a patient six year old uh, with truncus arteriosus. You can see a huge dilatation of the uh, ascending aorta. Other rare pathologies. Uh, can be uh, seen uh, what is called as familial aneurysms. Uh, and this is really not a well understood disease, but some families are prone to have uh, ascending aortic aneurysms uh, uh, for no specific uh, reason with no, spe with no specific other pathology, just uh, an ascending aortic aneurysm. Then some patients of course will have sporadic aneurysms, uh, including young patients without any family history of uh, uh, aneurysmal disease. The aortic root may be involved and actually in patients with Marfan syndrome, the aneurysm as you can see in this picture, usually begins in the aortic, uh, in the aortic sinuses. Uh, <clears throat> we can also see secondary dilatation of the aortic root and the ascending aorta after congenital cardiac surgery when the original aortic root is replaced by the pulmonary root. As you all know, in ROS procedure, <clears throat> we use the patient's own pulmonary valve to replace the aortic root, and most of us utilize a uh, full aortic root replacement. So part of the pulmonary uh, wall is actually incorporated into the uh, aortic root, and uh, this is subject to dilatation. 
Also, we see this in patients with arterial switch, again, where the uh, aorta and the pulmonary artery are switched. So to allow the uh, LV to be connected to the uh, uh, reconstructed aorta. So the origin, the neo aorta is originally a pulmonary artery and this can also be dilated. Also in patients where we do the damos case tonsil uh, connection, where the pulmonary artery is connected to a diminutive aorta to bypass a uh, narrow lift ventricular artery or tract or even aortic atresia. And these patients are also subject to have uh, dilatation of their aortic root. And as we have more survivors in children, <clears throat> the magnitude of this problem continues to grow. And uh, it, it, it has become actually a significant, uh, 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 what we'd call adult congenital uh, and maybe even uh, other ent uh, entity. This is a patient who had a ROS procedure where you can see that the aortic root and the ascending aorta are dilated. And uh, this is again because of the uh, use of the pulmonary uh, root as a replacement for the aortic, uh, for the aortic root. Uh, this is a patient with tetralogy of Palo, and you can see significant dilatation of the ascending aorta that even extends into the beginning of the aortic arch. Post-stenotic dilatation also is seen in patients with aortic stenosis, where it is believed that the jet of the aortic stenosis would <clears throat> hit against the greater curvature of the ascending aorta and cause progressive dilatation of the ascending uh, aorta. And this can become also aneurysmal. This is just an old paper published in circulation in 2001, where actually they looked at 88 uh, congenital heart disease patients with dilated aorta. And uh, this was a very large uh, spectrum of age starting from three weeks to 81 years. Uh, mean was 32 plus minus six years. There were 48 males and 40 females. And in those patients, they had surgical biopsy of the aortic wall. <clears throat> and in all of the patients, there were degenerative changes in the aortic wall where cystic medial necrosis was demonstrated in all of these uh, in these patients. So it just indicates that they have an intrinsic pathology in the aortic wall that may lead to the dilatation. Now, what happens in the dilatation? We have uh, uh, either in, as you can see in your left-hand side, where the sinotubular junction is effaced and disappears actually, and this results in that the aortic valve leaflets will become uh, separate and there will be an area of non-coaptation or malcoaptation in the center, and this can lead to aortic valve regurgitation. When the aortic root sinuses also dilate, even in the normal uh, sinotubular junction, again, the aortic valve leaflets become separate, and this can also result in aortic valve regurgitation. So <clears throat> a significant association of aortic aneurysms, uh, whether the root involved or not, is the aortic valve uh, disease. Unfortunately, ascending aortic aneurysms uh, tend to increase in size and eventually rupture or cause aortic dissection. And the size or the transverse diameter of the aneurysm is the most important predictor of rupture or uh, dissection. Aortic dissection is rarely seen in children, but rupture may happen. This is a, <clears throat> a 3D picture of an uh, ascending aortic aneurysm. Uh, uh, just looking at one modality, modality of the imaging for ascending aortic aneurysm. However, we have multiple modalities uh, uh, that include the echocardiography, uh, CT, uh, MRI and, uh, and and geography. And each of these has its pros and cons, but sometimes you may have to do these collectively to reach a definitive uh, diagnosis. However, for us, <clears throat> echocardiography uh, sometimes can be very adequate. As you all know, the normal anatomy of the aortic root, we have the sinotubular junction, then you have the, the sinuses of Valsalva, and you have the aortic, uh, and the aortic annulus. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the, by echocardiography, actually, they can uh, have measurement of these uh, levels 
of the aorta very uh, accurately. And sometimes the transthoracic or transesophageal echocardiography is all what you need for the diagnosis. And this is also is good because the echocardiography is an excellent modality to assess the uh, function of the aortic of the aortic valve uh, uh, and judge the amount of regurgitation. It is also uh, can tell you about the ventricular function. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, again, you can use it in the operating room much easier than any of the other modalities to check on uh, your repair, particularly if you have, uh, if you repair the aortic valve in these patients. Uh, MRI is an excellent modality and in generally uh, may be preferable to the CT scan. As you know, the CT scan has a uh, significant amount of radiation and because of these patients will require multiple uh, studies during their lifetime, uh, maybe the MRI is preferable. When following patients with aortic dilatation, not only the absolute diameter of the aortic segment is important, but also the diameter index to the body surface area. And we believe this is more, more important because particularly in children and, and in patients with a small size, because this allows serial comparison in growing children and also you can relate it to the Z uh, values. Uh, in general, as the figures we have, the upper limit of normal is about 21 millimeters per meter uh, square body surface area. Uh, if there is a significant dilatation, we're looking at more than 25 millimeters per meter square. And uh, uh, when the size is more than 27.5 millimeters per meter, per meter square, there's a significant dilatation with significant risk of, uh, of rupture. Uh, unfortunately, however, all the guidelines by all the societies uh, uh, do not consider the index diameter, but they rather uh, uh, talk about absolute uh, kind of size. Uh, this, as you see, these are the uh, recommendations of the European Society of Cardiology. You can see that the surgery <coughs> Class 1C surgery is indicated in patients who have aortic root aneurysm with maximal aortic diameter of more uh, than 50 millimeters uh, uh, for patients with Marfan syndrome. Uh, <clears throat> surgery should be considered in patients who have aortic root aneurysm with maximal ascending aortic diameter uh, of equal or more than 45 millimeters for patients with Marfan syndrome with risk factors. The most important risk factor is a history of rupture or in a, in, in a, in a, in a close family member. In patients with bicuspid aortic valve also, uh, one has to consider replacing the ascending aorta if it's, uh, if it's more than 50 uh, millimeters. And uh, <clears throat> in patients with other uh, aortopathies, maybe 55 centimeters uh, can be considered as a, uh, as a cutoff. However, lower thresholds uh, for intervention may be considered according to body surface area in patients of small stature and case of rapid progression. And this is the only time that is the uh, body index is uh, body surface area is used. Uh, believe it or not, you know, uh, medical management really has very limited role in these patients, but the general principle is cardiovascular risk adjustment. Uh, the goals of medical therapy, of course, is to reduce the sheer stress on the aneurysm as that may uh, slow the progression of growth of the, uh, of the uh, aneurysm and of course, blood pressure control. Most commonly used the drugs are the beta blockers, uh, the angiotensin II receptor blockers and the angiotensin converting enzyme uh, ACE inhibitors. Uh, it's very important, of course, to continue surveillance of these patients. Uh, generally, uh, a repeat study, maybe every six months, is, uh, is quite safe uh, and uh, can tell you exactly the rate of progression of the, uh, of the disease and make you have a better judgment to when to intervene. Uh, in general, all patients with an aortic diameter of more than 40 millimeters should have a regular follow-up. And when the diameter is more than 45 millimeters and the patient has a family history of dissection or rupture, uh, of, <clears throat> or if there is evidence of rapid progression 
more frequent follow-up is, is mandatory. Uh, in patients with uh, bicuspid aortic valve, I think there has been an adjustment of the guidelines, and these are the most recent guidelines published by the American College of uh, by the American College of Cardiology. I just mentioned that the surgical intervention is recommended in asymptomatic. Notice asymptomatic patients with bicuspid aortic valve and aortic root or aortic ascending aorta of more than 5.5 centimeters, irrespective of the need for surgery for the aortic valve. So if you have a patient with a, a bicuspid aortic valve who has an ascending aortic aneurysm of more than 5.5 centimeters, then that patient will go for surgery even if his valve is, is functioning well and does not need intervention. Surgical intervention is reasonable at 5 to 5.5 centimeters in diameter if an additional risk factor is present for aortic dissection like a rapid aortic growth or a family history of aortic dissection. And maybe in patients who cons are considered a low surgical risk. risk. However, in patients with bicuspid aortic valve planned for surgery on the aortic valve, it is reasonable to intervene on the ascending aorta, even if the size is smaller than that, maybe around 4.5 centimeters. And all of the <clears throat> this is a consensus uh, of expert uh, opinion. I think it's very reasonable you're going into uh, work on the aortic valve and the ascending aorta is dilated. It's very reasonable to, uh, to, to uh, uh, repair that and it doesn't add much to, the, uh, to your procedure. In other pathologies, uh, it's really uh, uh, variable, but there has been no uh, in, uh, to keep in mind that there has been no case reports of aortic rupture in aortas that are less than 55 millimeters in adult patients. So this diameter can be considered as a cutoff. And actually that's the reason why this, this uh, diameter is considered uh, uh, used as a cutoff. However, a diameter of more than six centimeter, uh, six, mil, uh, six centimeters is considered a threshold at which one should consider surgical intervention, particularly if there is evidence of rapid progression. Unfortunately, no guidelines exist for erythropathies in congenital heart disease. Uh, and the, if you look at the European Society of Cardiology guidelines for adults with congenital heart disease, they only mention the following in their guidelines, like surgical treatment for ascending aortic dilatation and coarctation may be considered when the diameter is more than 55 millimeters, uh, which is more than 27.5. Uh, millimeters per meter square body surface area, or if there is rapid progression. They also mentioned that aortic uh, surgery should be considered after arterial switch uh, operation when the knee aortic root is more than 55 millimeters. And in their guidelines, this is the only thing that is mentioned about patients with congenital, with congenital heart disease. Uh, individuals with Turner syndrome who are more than 18 years of age with a ascending aortic size index of 2.5 centimeters per meter square should be considered for an aortic operation to prevent rupture or dissection because this particular disease is, is well known for a higher incidence of rupture and dissection. So the threshold is a little bit lower in patients with Turner syndrome. If you come to surgery, uh, uh, <coughs> basically uh, uh, there are some variations in the techniques, but in, in general, we use cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, arterial cannulation, uh, depending on the how far the dilatation in the ascending aorta, you can cannulate the transverse arch. Some people utilize the right axillary artery uh, or the femoral artery uh, to deal with these uh, aneurysms. Venous cannulation is usually done through the right atrium then the temperature uh, depends on the distal end anastomosis. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I personally, if it's, it's high, I would utilize a brief period of circulatory arrest to make sure uh, that you've got a, a good uh, anastomosis. Uh, and as you remember, you know, these are uh, very friable tissues and the anastomosis can be uh, very uh, difficult. So if you have a, just a little bit of aorta beyond your cross clamp, and you're trying to suture that to a UR proximal graft or something, you know, you're likely to uh, run into trouble. 
So a brief period, you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes of circulatory arrest can make you do a good anastomosis. And I think uh, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite safe. Of course, uh, cardioplegic arrest is, uh, is used. Now, uh, talking about the valve sparing procedures, uh, we believe that if the aortic valve is functioning well, then valve sparing procedures are preferred, particularly in growing children and young adults whenever possible, as the aortic valve is often normal. However, usually a good size prosthesis can be implanted even in children, as the aortic annulus is usually uh, large. Uh, surgery, this is not an easy surgery, and therefore surgery should be performed in centers with expertise in this uh, type of, uh, of surgery. There are various ways to dealing with various uh, pathologies. Uh, the simplest is the, what we call the aortic wrap for mild to moderate ascending aortic dilatation, particularly with other cardiac surgery, aortic wrapping has been performed. We actually take a, a, a graft uh, a dacron tube and you know open it like a sheet and then uh, put it around the dilated aorta and sew it to reduce the size and prevent uh, prog uh, progression of the dilatation. And this can offer good lasting outcomes in selected patients. Then uh, there is another uh, way of doing it as, you know, particularly in patients with post-synotic dilatation of the, with aortic stenosis, where most of the dilatation is in the greater curvature of the ascending aorta. What we call the reduction aortoplasty for ascending aortic aneurysms. Uh, we actually can, as you can see in these various panels, you excise <coughs> part of the aortic wall and so the uh, aorta primarily. So you're keeping the original aortic uh, tissue, but getting rid of the part that is dilated. And there are a little bit different techniques to do this appropriately. Uh, but I think in panel A, if can be done, this is probably the simplest and the easiest. Uh, sometimes you may not uh, want to excise the wall, but rather than apply Kate uh, uh, with, with suture plaquette that, that, uh, dilated, uh, that dilated part. Uh, patients who are suitable for uh, this particular uh, procedure, uh, I think is, is a limited number. Now, when the sinotubular junction is dilated uh, or effaced, uh, the aortic valve can become incompetent in the presence of normal leaflets, uh, as, you, as you see here and as you have seen uh, before. And actually, uh, uh, you know, here uh, with us and with uh, Dr. When, uh, Dr. Carlos Duran, we introduced uh, this uh, <clears throat> technique uh, of uh, uh, reconstructing, again, if you want to say, the sinotubular junction. And we call it the supra crest, the supra aortic crest enhancement, where actually you can uh, kind of uh, pinch uh, the aorta at, uh, at for three sites, sometimes even four sites, to try and reconstruct the uh, sinotubular junction. And by reconstructing the sinotubular junction, you can uh, bring the aortic valve leaflets back together, and uh, and uh, that will make them co-op and get rid of the uh, regurgitation. However, this can uh, be done also utilizing a graft replacement. Uh, where they actually the size of the graft would correspond to the size, the original size of the sinotubular junction. And as you can see here, when you, uh, the, that the uh, sinotubular junction is effaced, uh, the aortic valve leaflets are non-co-opting. You uh, excise the aneurysm and you put a graft uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in replacing the ascending aorta, restoring the sinotubular junction, and that can make the valve uh, competent, uh, competent again. Uh, <clears throat> the other, uh, the other uh, way, of course, is having to replace the whole uh, aortic uh, aortic root, and uh, then deal with the uh, with the aortic uh, valve. And we'll mention that in a minute. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes uh, you don't, you know, you just excise the uh, uh, supra uh, coronary. Uh, aortic aneurysm and just do a simple interposition graft. Uh, occasionally you can resect the non-coronary sinus and make a, a tongue of your dacron tube 
to fill in that uh, sinus and sometimes that is, uh, uh, that is sufficient. Uh, and this will simplify, the, will simplify the procedure as you don't have to do the coronary transfer. Now, if the aortic valve uh, is good, but the annulus, often the annulus is dilated, and that can be <clears throat> the reason resulting in the regurgitation, then you can, uh, then we can uh, do the uh, aortic valve uh, leaflet repairs. And uh, one of those is the doing the subcommissural annuloplasty. We actually take a pledged suture and take it, you know, uh, from below the uh, aortic valve leaflets. Uh, I'm sure you have seen what we call the uh, subcommissural triangle. And that is the little triangle below the commissures. And when, you know, with the uh, subcommissural annuloplasty, you try and reduce that, uh, that, that uh, <clears throat> angle and uh, bring the uh, uh, leaflets closer together for coaptation. <clears throat> and you can do this at the, at the three commissural, subcommissural annuloplasty. Uh, Trussler uh, described this particular technique to uh, uh, apply it, the, re, the redundant or the prolapsing aortic valve uh, leaflet, where actually the <coughs> prolapsing edge of the leaflet is, is sewn to the aortic valve uh, wall, to the aortic wall with the sutures to uh, get rid of the prolapse and uh, make the leaflets co opt again. Another technique described by Tyrone David, where actually <clears throat> a fine uh, gortic suture is taken from outside the aorta into the aortic valve leaflets, and this kind of goes uh, back and forth through the aortic valve leaflet to uh, uh, resuspend the leaflet and make it uh, co-opt again, as you can see in this uh, in this uh, in this drawing. Uh, I like this particular technique. I think it can uh, work uh, very nicely to lift up a prolapsing uh, leaflet and give you a good aortic valve uh, repair. Then <clears throat> one technique I find uh, personally uh, helpful is uh, because sometimes it's very difficult uh, when you do the subcommissural aneuploplasty or you do the leaflet the suspension and etc. Sometimes it's very difficult to judge whether your uh, uh, cooptation is, is, is adequate to uh, stop all the regurgitation. So <clears throat> what uh, you can do is uh, put a, a circumferential uh, suture around the uh, ascending aorta. So what I do is say uh, the aortic annulus is dilated and I want to reduce the size after I do the subcommissural annuloplasty, I would pass a, uh, uh, I would check the uh, uh, normal size of the aortic uh, root for this particular body surface area, and maybe put a Hager or a dilator into the aortic root and tie a, one of the uh, pair string or the one of these uh, circumferential sutures around the aortic root. And I would leave the other on a snare, just in case you need to tighten that more so we come off pump and under echocardiographic guidance, uh, we look at the aortic valve. If the, the aortic valve is competent and everything is fine uh, with your original uh, circumferential suture, that's well and good. You can just tie, tie the other suture and end there. But for instance, if you find that <clears throat> your, uh, your first one is either too tight or too loose, then you can use the second, uh, uh, the second uh, uh, suture to adjust your uh, cooptation of the leaflets uh, under echocardiographic guidance again, so you don't have to go back on pump to do uh, the procedure once more. And it's, it's, a, it's a nice trick that is uh, really uh, uh, helpful. Now, uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, other thing, uh, particularly in children, when it comes uh, to the fact that your aortic root is totally destroyed, uh, then maybe uh, uh, you can replace the aortic valve uh, <clears throat> with the uh, uh, mechanical valve. And uh, when the uh, in children, as you know, the annulus may be, uh, uh, may, be, may be small, and therefore, you know, this Conorastan procedure was introduced 
where then actually a ventricular septal defect is created to enlarge the annulus. This VSD is, is patched, and then this would allow to put a larger uh, prosthetic uh, prosthesis into the aortic into the aortic annulus. When the uh, ROS became rather popular, uh, instead of a mechanical valve, it was suggested that a, uh, a pulmonary autograft can be utilized. Uh, again, in this particular uh, procedure, a VSD is created, and uh, when the autograft is harvested from the right ventricle, a tongue of tissue is taken, and that tongue of tissue is wedged into the ventricular septal defect. Uh, and uh, then this is what was called the modified uh, uh, Roscono. However, uh, from our Ross experience, we uh, know that the RV muscle below the pulmonary valve is not a good support for the outflow tract. And that uh, muscle is weak and with, with time it can dilate and actually can become aneurysmal. And in our series, actually, we had two patients where there were uh, aneurysms developed in the left ventricular outflow tract from uh, the weak RV muscle below the pulmonary valve. So we don't do this procedure. <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, I introduced uh, what I call the uh, uh, mini uh, Ross Cono, where actually a mini Cono incision is made. As you can see here in panel A, you got the aortic valve uh, excised. The coronaries are uh, removed with the button of tissue around. The pulmonary autograft is harvested. So you have a heart here where the RV is open, uh, the LV is open. The LV is very, uh, is, is uh, outflow, to the left ventricular outflow tract is narrow, so you do your muscle resection. And because the right ventricle is open, the septum is in front of you, so you can actually, between two fingers, palpate the thickness of the septum and excise as much as necessary of the uh, ventricular septum on the left side to open up the left ventricular outflow tract. And actually, all what you have to do afterwards is just sacrifice the annulus, and you don't have to do any major enlargement. All the all we have to do is to open up the left ventricular outflow tract to match the size of the patient's own pulmonary valve, which is often uh, small and not dilated. There. And actually, this simplifies the procedure. You don't have to uh, create a ventricular septal defect. And in our <clears throat> experience, we have patients who actually have done the procedure this you know for more than 15 years and they demonstrated a uh, normal growth of the aortic annulus with no progressive dilatation and with adequate aortic valve, uh, aortic valve function. Then we come to the uh, <coughs> uh, uh, other types of intervention. We actually have to replace the, uh, the, uh, the ascending aorta and the aortic valve uh, as well. So you have a diseased uh, uh, aortic valve. Uh, you have a, uh, uh, a disease ascending aorta. So you're doing going to do a composite type of uh, surgery where actually you have to deal with the aortic valve and the ascending aorta. And then the uh, options that are uh, available uh, we have the mechanical uh, valve conduit replacement, uh, classically known as the Bintal procedure, where actually you replace the aortic valve with the, uh, and the ascending aorta as a one unit uh, with what we you call a valve, uh, a mechanical valve conduit. And again, and you transfer the coronaries into this conduit. If you don't want to use a mechanical valve, there are uh, biological valve conduits that are available where actually you do the same like a bental, and actually some would call it a biologic bental, where you also replace all of the aortic root and you transfer the coronaries. You may want to also replace the aortic valve and the root and use a homograft in that position. And this may have advantages uh, because of the uh, uh, 
uh, size is even if you have to use a smaller size, uh, the because the the homograft is 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 normal valve tissue, you uh, uh, end up with really uh, good gradients. Uh, as you know, if you use a small biological uh, prosthesis, there might be a residual a residual gradient. So if you use a homograft, this allows you to use a smaller size uh, valve and does not produce a homograft. And actually that's one of the advantages of the ROS procedure where actually <coughs> uh, the, the autograft functions in the aortic position as a normal valve with very minimal gradients. And then you got the other option where we call the uh, aortic valve a preserving uh, uh, aortic root uh, surgery, where actually you do repair the original valve and then replace the ascending aorta with the, with the graft. Uh, this is just the uh, uh, picture of um, uh, what is available as a uh, uh, mechanical valve uh, conduit for the replacement. And you can see it here with the coronary uh, transfer. Uh, this is our biological uh, valve the conduit again, the uh, biologic, uh, uh, the biologic uh, bentan. And this is a homograft where actually <coughs> uh, you do the aortic root with the homograft and again transfer the coronaries. The homograft might be short and you may end up uh, using an interposition graft also to replace the rest of the dilated uh, ascending aorta. Then uh, the uh, uh, for valve preserving for valve preserving aortic root procedures, we have the two major uh, techniques. Uh, one was described originally by uh, Dr. Yakub, and uh, this is referred to as the remodeling uh, uh, technique. And if you look in the picture here in front of Dr. Yakub picture. The uh, valve, of course, is, is repaired whatever type, you know, the valve is going to be preserved. You repair it, you're happy with the valve. So you just reduce, replace the <coughs> aortic root without replacing the valve. So in the remodeling technique, uh, the uh, uh, posts of the original aortic valve are kept intact outside the dacronal tube. The dacronal tube is a slit, and uh, as you can see in here, and the uh, uh, aortic valve posts are in, in, uh, inserted into the uh, dacronal tube as, as a composite part of the dacronal tube. And this is, of course, uh, keeps the elasticity of the aortic root and makes it physiologically function much, uh, much better. So hemodynamics are, are excellent for this. However, the, the disadvantage of this, as you will see a little bit later, is that this is a native aortic root which can, which is uh, originally diseased and the possibility of progression or dilatation of that aortic root exists. Then, you know, David, uh, Tyron David uh, from uh, Toronto uh, introduced this reimplantation technique where actually the whole root is, the, again, again, the aortic valve is, is replaced, but the aortic valve apparatus is, is pulled inside the dacronal tube and sutured inside the dacronal tube. So you end up with the aortic valve apparatus inside the dacronal tube uh, and uh, uh, the, the tube, the dacron itself anchors the aortic root and prevents dilatation. And the uh, uh, aortic valve functions inside uh, normally. However, if you uh, look uh, here, the freedom from uh, moderate or severe aortic valve uh, regurgitation uh, with the triangles is the reimplantation technique of Tyron David, and the circles is the remodeling technique of Yakub. As you can see, as time goes on, the number of patients with the reimplant with the remodeling technique uh, that develop uh, aortic valve regurgitation and may require the operation. Is, is larger and this drop off starts something around like B after uh, six, seven years of, of surgery. While the drop off in patients with the reimplantation technique is much, uh, is much slower. This is just one paper that compared uh, the uh, two procedures, uh, aortic valve sparing operation in aortic root aneurysms, remodeling or reimplantation. And the conclusion of this paper, uh, current evidence is in favor of the David technique over the Yakub technique in pathologies such as the Marfan syndrome 
acute type aortic, uh, acute type aortic dissection and excessive annular dilatation, uh, <clears throat> which may impair aortic root integrity. Careful selection of patients for each technique and successful distortion of normal castle geometry are the key to success of these, uh, of these operations. Uh, one uh, kind of criticism of the uh, uh, David procedure is the fact that you are putting the aortic valve inside the cylinder while the original aortic valve has the sinuses. Uh, uh, and then so the, uh, uh, the police from Italy came up with uh, this uh, idea of making sinuses in the uh, in the uh, in the dacron tube, and now we have these dacron tubes with and without valve, who, with, where they actually got a simulation of the aortic valve sinuses of Valsalva, and uh, <clears throat> it it kind of made uh, the re, the uh, uh, procedure uh, to try and mimic me uh, more physiologic uh, than putting it inside the tube. But you know, believe it or not, you know, despite that, many of the surgeons nowadays will use this particular uh, uh, graft for the uh, David procedure. David himself does not believe in this, and he insists that the aortic root is cylinder, and that you don't need uh, this uh, graft with the uh, with the sinuses. Uh, So uh, just in summary, aortic root pathology is commonly seen in association with congenital heart disease and awareness with this problem is increasing. Current guidelines do not specifically address this issue and intervention is basically extrapolated from adult literature. Valve sparing procedures are preferred, particularly in children. Prosthetic aortic root replacement may be required and for primary aortic valve disease and associated ascending aortic dilatation, our preference, uh, of course, is for the modified mini uh, Roscona procedure, which I explained to you and, uh, and uh, we introduced uh, from this institution. Thank you. Any questions, uh, happy to answer. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zuhair, uh, for your presentation. Um, uh, if you allow me, uh, first, uh, also thank you for your uh, time. Uh, I know you have a busy schedule. Uh, the thing is, uh, Dr. Personally, do you believe there is a difference between this uh, valve, uh, I mean, uh, the one with valve graft or the cylinder, or you go with the, with the Tyron um, uh, opinion that is cylinder? Yeah, I think for, uh, you know, I think the, uh, for, for uh, uh, native valve, I think I would go for the sinus of Valsalva because actually in, in, in some of the cases that we have done with the original David uh, technique where, you know, inside a regular Dacron tube, we have seen in two patients rapid deterioration of the aortic valve function. And we postulated that because there are no sinuses, the aortic leaflets, when they open, they hit against the dacron, which is rather stiff. And with time, the uh, aortic valve leaflets can degenerate rapidly. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, for uh, uh, the function, for the optimal function of the aortic valve leaflets, I think the sinuses are, are uh, probably important. And uh, uh, since the sinuses have been introduced, we have been for the aortic preserving aortic root surgery. We have been using the, the ones with the with the with the sinuses. However, if you got a if you end up with placing the valve with a mechanical valve, I think you we, you have a valve conduit with uh, mechanical valve conduit with sinuses of Alzalva, and I don't see much advantages to that particular. Uh, in uh, you know uh, valve conduit uh, because it's not going to make much difference you know you have a, a valve conduit I mean a mechanical valve working inside doesn't really have to hit against the wall and etc. So the indications for using a valve uh, conduit with sinusal valve alpha in my opinion are limited. Okay, uh, Doctor, how about if, if I have for example, uh, tri-leaflet aortic valve with the 
uh, with the uh, uh, ascending aorta is around 4.4, 4.3. Uh, would you uh, plicate externally or do you either uh, replace the whole thing or uh, keep it the same? You mean uh, you mean the aortic valve is normal or you're doing aortic valve surgery? Uh, I'm doing aortic valve surgery, but the ascending is yeah. uh, a bit dilated because most is tenetic dilatation. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I would just, you know, if it's around that uh, uh, figure, I would just, you know, plicate. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> generally, in almost all patients with post-genetic dilatations, I've been, I have been doing, you know, plication of the greater curvature, you know, to reduce the size a little bit. Because I think, you know, when once you repair the aortic valve or deal with the aortic valve problem, I think, you know, the, the, the hemodynamic that resulted in the expansion of the ascending aorta is, is taken care of, you know, so that should result in stabilization of the ascending aorta and prevent further dilatation. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Any other question from the audience? Um, thank you, Prof, for this uh, nice presentation. From your experience, do you think there is any difference between biological and mechanical? Mechanical bental and old age, especially with low target of INR for aortic valve. Well, you know, as you know, <clears throat> uh, the biological uh, bental is a good option for old people, but of course, the main advantage of is is avoidance of uh, of uh, of anticoagulation and all its complications. However, they're still, you know, liable to degenerate. And, uh, but uh, as you know, in older people, you know, they, they will probably last longer and maybe even outlast the patient's, uh, the patient's uh, life. Uh, I just wanted to caution you about the uh, aortic valve with low INR. As you know, till now, this has not been proving to be safe. Uh, people have used uh, lower INR in addition with aspirin. But it's still, you know, that has not been proven. There is only uh, the, the studies that have been done so far demonstrated uh, uh, that this is not a safe option. Uh, so uh, the newer mechanical valves, as you know, they say that they may be uh, better hemodynamics and they would allow you to use lower INR. But uh, the only company that claims that I think is the Onyx. And they just about a year ago, they started another randomized study where they actually not using uh, uh, aspirin, but they're using one of the newer oral, uh, co co you know, the oral uh, antithrombin 10 uh, anticoagulants. Uh, so we still, till now, don't have an evidence that even an aortic valve position that lower INR is safe. So this is just a cautious, uh, a caution for you guys. Thank you, bro. Uh, any other question? <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, uh, Prof Zuhair. Uh, kindly, I have one question. I heard, and also I heard in one of the one of the conferences. Also, uh, it's, I read that. In the future, especially in Saudi Arabia, the projected number of patients that with bicuspid aortic valve or the one who need to have aortic surgery will be large, especially we, we are and in general a young population. What do you think of that and what we can do in the future? I mean, in terms of do we need more specialized, uh, uh, for example, the one who graduated to, to be more specialized in aortic surgery uh, or what your advice regarding this I particular issue? Well, I, I don't <clears throat> I don't think that we have any epidemiologic study in uh, in Saudi Arabia to demonstrate that. But uh, it's a known fact that you know uh, aortic valve stenosis is a disease of older age. Uh, the uh, whether it's a bicuspid or or trileaflet aortic valve, and as you know. Uh, with the advent of the TAVI, 
the number of uh, patients with aortic valve stenosis that have come now to intervention have maybe tripled even compared to, uh, to before. And of course, it's very likely that this may happen in, in, in Saudi Arabia as well. Uh, but you know, uh, the, the bad news, of course, that a large chunk of those will go to the cardiology, not for you guys. But if any of you would uh, go through the, uh, I mean, the, uh, what is now known as a hybrid uh, training, you know, then maybe you can uh, get some of those patients. Uh, uh, as you know, there are programs now uh, in, in in North America that would offer that would offer catheter uh, skills training for the uh, cardiac surgeons. So uh, maybe for those who are interested in adult cardiac surgery, uh, that could be a, a kind of a a good thing to consider uh, to do uh, uh, after you finish your residency here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any more questions? I just would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Zuhair Halis to accept uh, our invitation to our academic activity. It's been a great pleasure to hear from you and uh, thank you for, I, I hope that everyone uh, uh, got the, uh, the experience and the knowledge that Dr. And Prof. Zuhar Al-Haris has, has delivered. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Haris. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we will have uh, Dr. Muhammad Al-Rafai, as consultant uh, cardiac surgery in King Faisal uh, Jeddah. Uh, Dr. Muhammad, um, are you with us? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. May Dr. If you allow like a 10 minute or 9 minute break, then uh, we continue at 2.30 two if you time allow. That's fine. Okay, we'll see you back at 2.30. Inshallah. So, Mu'ad, inshallah, 2.30.
ما ادري عبد البديع جاهز المحاضره جاهز المحاضره اعطيني ايش السكرين Uh, everyone can see uh, my screen. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Second lecture is aortic valve replacement and mechanical prosthesis. Uh, Dr. Abdul Aziz uh, uh, with the guest consultant uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad uh, Rifai. Uh, so you can start, Abdul Badi. Uh, thank you, Roy. Uh, Salam alaikum. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, before I uh, good afternoon. Uh, before I start, uh, I would like to thank uh, both Prof. Zahir Al-Halis for his amazing lecture. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Muhammad Al-Rifai for joining uh, our academic uh, activity today. For those who don't know me, my name is Abdul Badir Bogus. I'm R6, resident from King Faisal Specialist Hospital, Jeddah. My lecture today will be about aortic valve replacement with mechanical prosthesis. Uh, this is a continuation of the previous lectures, Dr. Anwar and Dr. Abir. Uh, I guess last week they discussed the anatomy and pathophysiology of aortic valve disease uh, and then the latest American Heart Association guidelines in aortic valve. So to outline my uh, lecture, I'll be talking about history of mechanical valve prosthesis, main points in valve selection, the main randomized uh, clinical trials studying outcomes of mechanical versus tissue valves, American Heart Association 2020 recommendation in valve selection, valve selection in end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis, valve selection in child-bearing uh, age, anticoagulation strategy for pregnant women uh, with mechanical valve. Then I'll go over the surgical uh, technique on how to approach the valve, the aortic valve, and the steps of aortic valve replacement. After that, we'll discuss a uh, few circumstances that can happen post-operatively, uh, and a few points, including uh, patient prosthesis mismatch, and importance of effective orifice area, and peak gradient through prosthetic valve. And then the management of acute valve thrombosis post AVR. Last thing, uh, uh, one slide about the follow-up after uh, AVR. Uh, definitive uh, therapy for aortic valve disease was not available until the, uh, until the invention of uh, cardiopulmonary bypass in the late 50. After that, all innovative cardiac surgeons began to invent and develop cardiac valve prosthesis. I would say over the past 60 years, a variety of prosthesis that have been developed and evolved and become widely available for use. This include mechanical valve, uh, which means that is all human made, stented biological valve that is made of uh, out of animal tissue that is mounted on artificial stent or strut to hold its structure. Stented biological, a stentless biological valve, which is which has no supporting stent. Human homograft, uh, whether isolated only valve replacement or whole aortic root replacement. And, uh, and then a combination uh, of biological pulmonary autograft and uh, uh, pulmonary outflow tract replacement with heterograft, which is known as uh, ROS procedure. Uh, uh, most recently, the innovation of TAVI, uh, transatrial uh, aortic valve implantation, tissue valve, has gained approval in Europe and North America with acceptable results. Also, the novel sutureless uh, tissue valve has emerged recently in the literature. In this talk, I will focus on the use of mechanical valve replacement in the aortic position. Until today, there is no medical treatment that can treat aortic stenosis. It has to be surgically replaced. On the other hand, aortic insufficiency can be well tolerated by patients for many years uh, on the expense of ventricular dilatation. After that, downhill progression until it requires surgical replacement on an urgent basis. 1952 was the first time Havnagel used his uh, used the aortic ball in a cage, heterotopically, heterotopically meaning uh, in different position than the normal aortic valve. 
he placed it in the descending aorta, uh, thoracic aorta to treat uh, basically AI. Shortly after the, uh, the invention of cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, surgical pioneers like Dr. Starr, Braunwald, and Harkin began placing the ball in a cage aortic valve in the normal orthotopic position. And then the first generation of aortic uh, valve processes, uh, which is ball in a cage, became the standard for AVR for almost a decade. Uh, this model has uh, undergone multiple modification uh, that have, uh, have been applied overcome, to overcome its main problems, which is the fact that it, it requires intense anticoagulation and hemodynamic compromise, potential outflow obstruction with this uh, ball occluder, and also an abnormal flow pattern associated with this model. All these problems has led to the development of the next uh, gener uh, generation of aortic valve prosthesis, the tilting disc valve. Innovators such as uh, 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 York, Hall, Castor, and Dr. Lelehai developed three different models of tilting disc that become the most commonly implanted AVR devices between 68 and, and the 80. As you can notice, uh, the low profile uh, configuration has uh, simplified surgical implantation. However, the problems uh, with tilting disc uh, valves include uh, stasis, eddy current formation, uh, uh, flow orifice, and also embolization uh, of the leaflet, which has uh, happened in a few cases, causing death uh, of their patients, led to the withdrawal and discontinuation of York Shaley valve. This is the York Shaley valve. And uh, later castor, uh, Lelehai castor uh, prosthesis evolved into the Omnisense valve. Uh, with uh, which is now discontinued. Metron Metronic hole valve is the third and the last model of tilting disc uh, prosthesis that is now also discontinued. Later on, Kalk and Lelehai have teamed up and uh, made the first rigid bileaflet uh, valve, which has had uh, limited clinical use at the beginning. But in 1977, St. Jude, Medica uh, Jude Medical Valve came out uh, for the first time and was implanted and developed by Nikolov and his group. group, uh, group. Uh, then uh, after that, uh, over the following decade, St. Jude Medical has become the standard, nearly obviated all other kind of me me mechanical valve processes wor worldwide. So St. Jude Mechanical Valve demonstrated uh, lower aortic gradient, minimal aortic insufficiency, low rate of thromboembolism, uh, anticoagulation still continue to be necessary, however, to a lesser extent than the previous design model. Because of the low profile design and the lesser need for orientation, surgical implantation was further simplified. Following the St. Jude medical valve, several other third generation model of bileaflet processes were introduced. This including the Sussler uh, from Carbomedic valve, the top hat, and the ATS medical prosthesis, and the Onyx uh, prosthesis. These are the bioleaflet models from all companies have undergone multiple modification on their designs over the past 25 years. For example, you have the ATS here, um, have changed the pivot style into an open pivot design, allowing for more flexibility and possibly less noises. St. Jude uh, Medical has changed the sewing ring into uh, uh, to allow larger size to be implanted. The Sizzler uh, or top hat uh, from Carbomedics also modified the sewing ring so that it can, uh, 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 that valve is implanted uh, in supra valver position. Uh, Onyx uh, also added the advances of uh, pyrolytic carbon technology and some more coat, uh, flexible coating to allow better resembling and mim mimicking the normal flow pattern. The most recent St. Jude uh, medical valve introduced was the St. Jude Regent here. Uh, which uh, they have modified the sewing ring and also the external profile to increase the effective orifice area, uh, allowing larger procedures to be implanted. We'll talk about the effective orifice area at the end of the lecture. This is the, uh, the mechanical valve here, and this is the um, uh, biological valve here. It's, it shows the evolution of a mechanical valve and then all the types uh, of mechanical valve. Here uh, on the biological side, I'm not gonna talk about, but briefly, this is a stented porcine. Uh, stented meaning it has a stent that the, uh, the, the tissues can hold onto. Uh, this is stent that goes around. And then uh, it, it's, uh, it, uh, there's a porcine 
and bovine, uh, bovine bovine come from uh, pigs and bovine from cows and then we have the stentless which does not have any uh, uh, strut or any um, uh, uh, structure that can uh, hold on to the tissue and then the most recent the sutureless uh, uh, valves in aortic position it is uh, worth mentioning uh, that with all these advances uh, designs modification on mechanical procedures over the past decade, the use of mechanical aortic valve has decreased uh, worldwide and the trends keep on decreasing for uh, mechanical valves. Uh, mechanical valves. The, this attributed to the improvement of the longev longevity of the uh, tissue aortic valve and the introduction of TAVI and also the potential valve and valve TAVI in case if the tissue valve has failed uh, in the future. Okay. All right. Uh, quick review of the literature on how uh, that shows uh, different studies that have influenced the valve selection. Randomized studies have shown no difference in survival in both groups, biologic or mechanical. Conversely, uh, non-randomized studies where, uh, where patients were followed over a longer period showed uh, freedom from all valve-related events and freedom from reoperation were improved in mechanical group. And most recent publication uh, have shown improved uh, surgical uh, survival in patients having uh, bileaflet mechanical prosthesis. This is attributed to the results. Uh, this they attributed the results uh, to the fact that uh, improved anticoagulation regimen and the newer generation and the longer uh, patient follow-up. All right. So, what is the perfect valve, or uh, 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 what is the uh, the meaning? Is what is expected of an ideal valve? Uh, be... uh, the, um, the yeah, sure. could, could you please go back one slide? Yeah. Yeah, recently study by leaflet mechanical valve improved survival. You are referring to, I think that study was published, I think Oxford, not Oxford, um, the one university in the US. The one was published in the New England of Journal. That's a study comparing mechanical versus tissue. Yeah. The one you quoted? Yes. That showed aortic is better in survival, mitral no difference, right? Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. I, I guess uh, to, uh, I want to be sure. Is, is it that one or there is a new one yeah. I, I don't know about? Yeah. No, it's the one. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Um, so um, what uh, we are expected of an ideal valve to be implanted is that we want excellent hemodynamic. So the gradient across the valve uh, when it's inserted is low and it does not regurgitate. We want it uh, non-thrombogenic, uh, so no need for warfarin or if on warfarin, less risk of thromboembolism. Durability is an important issue. Uh, how long does it last when the patient advances in age? Uh, some patients want uh, one valve for life. Unrestricted, unrestricted availability. For example, like homograft, does it need to be pre-ordered in advance? Are all the valve sizes uh, are available? Or needs to talk to the uh, company representative in advance? Easily implantable, easier to be implanted surgically, is easier for the surgeons. Uh, silent function, this is more applicable uh, for mechanical valves. They are very noisy and the noise level varies from valve to valve. For example, Onyx, as though it is favorable for its lower thrombogenicity, it produces the highest noises, and then ATS produces less noises, and then St. Jude Mechanical is, uh, I think, in between. Low cost is uh, also important in countries with lower economy uh, or hospital with lower budget, uh, so that can uh, be an important factor. Uh, what are the factors uh, that should be considered when uh, choosing uh, between mechanical and bioprosthetic valve? Several factors, some are general, some are uh, specific, uh, related to specific scenarios and condition, but the basic principles most consistently reproduced in the literature are the following. The type of valve does not uh, influence the following, influence the following, does not influence survival, does not influence thromboembolism, nor infective endocarditis rates. All these have the same rate in both valves. Bleeding is more frequent with mechanical. Structural valve deterioration is more frequent with bioprosthetic valve, tissue valve. And then uh, for mechanical valves, the uh, mechanical valve, uh, valve is preferred uh, choice if the age is less than 60, 
and patients who don't want uh, another operation, if the patient is already on warfarin for another reason, and uh, tissue valve is preferred if the, uh, is a preferred choice if the patient is over 65, uh, if the patient preferred uh, to avoid warfarin for any reason, uh, the content indication uh, to a warfarin or woman of childbearing age, uh, active lifestyle, GI bleeding, or etc. All right, uh, the two historic randomized clinical trials compared outcomes after valve replacement with tissue versus mechanical. They used the first generation porcine heterograft, which is a tissue valve, versus the York Shelley tilting disc, which is mechanical valve. Uh, these are the trials, the Edinburgh heart valve trial and the Veteran Affair VA cooperative study on uh, valve heart disease. The Edinburgh trial was conducted between 1975 and 1979, almost five years with an average follow-up of 20 years. The VA trial was conducted almost at the same time between 77 and 80, 82, with an average follow-up of 15 years. As we said, both compared outcomes after uh, valve replacement with the original mechanical York Shelley tilting disc and the first generation of porcine uh, tissue Hancock or Carpentier Edward. The primary outcome for Edinburgh, uh, uh, one, we have uh, no survival difference between the patient who underwent mechanical and bi biologic AVR. Uh, number two, we have uh, the bleeding. Bleeding rates were greater following uh, mechanical AVR than bioprosthetic valve. Reoperation rates uh, were greater following bioprosthesis than mechanical. Thromboembolism and uh, prosthetic valve endocarditis rates were the same for both valves. The primary outcomes for VA trial were uh, as it shows, the patient with mechanical AVR had better long-term survival uh, than tissue valve. There was no evidence of structural valve de degeneration with mechanical valve of uh, the York Shelley. A uh, patient who underwent uh, mechanical AVR had lower redo at 15 years than those with uh, tissue AVR. Tissue valve uh, were associated with less bleeding, but the same thromboembolism rate uh, as mechanical valve. So all in all, uh, both trials showed increased bleeding associated with mechanical valve and increased reoperation uh, with tissue valve that is due to structural valve deterioration. This is the latest 2020 updates of American Heart Association recommendation regarding valve type uh, selection, bioprosthesis or tissue versus mechanical valve. Class one recommend uh, recommendation is a shared decision-making uh, process that takes into consideration several, several important factors related to the patient themselves and valve specific features and other uh, specific medical condition that is associated with each case. These factors are summarized well in this uh, following table. So the factors on the left side of the screen is uh, if they are present, they would favor implanting mechanical valve. Factors on the right side would favor uh, implanting uh, a tissue valve if they were present. So we can see a young patient less than 50 uh, would have significant high rate of structural valve deterioration. So they would favor mechanical one. Whereas older patient older than 65 usually have higher risk of anticoagulation compared uh, a complication. So they would, uh, they, would, uh, they would avoid mechanical valve and so forth. Preference, if the patient does not uh, mind or is willing to accept the potential risk of redo surgery, then this uh, factor also plays a role. Also the compliance level the, with the medication and how easy they can uh, access the medical care facility to regulate their um, anticoagulation. Furthermore, the availability of TAVI and valve in valve in some higher specialized comprehensive valve centers has changed the dynamic of this discussion when choosing between mechanical versus uh, prosthesis. This diagram right here, also from the uh, American Heart Association guideline, would simplify the decision-making process. So it shows here uh, at the beginning after uh, discussion of the patient is uh, not fit for anticoagulation either. Uh, 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 this is a vitamin K, sorry, this is vitamin K, antagonist, which is uh, uh, warfarin, uh, if the patient is not fit for anticoagulation, either contraindicated or less compliance, or simply does not want it, then tissue valve is recommended. This is class one recommendation. Whereas if the patient is, uh, is willing to go for anticoagulation and happen to require uh, AVR, then it depends on how old the patient is. If the patient is less than 50, 
will be offered a uh, mechanical valve. Uh, this is class 2A recommendation. But if uh, the patient wants tissue valve and happens to have a favorable anatomy and is being served in, uh, by a comprehensive valve center, then ROS procedure can be offered uh, if the experience is available. Uh, this is a class 2B recommendation. If the patient is over 65, uh, then we would offer uh, them tissue valve. In between 50 to 65, other factors can play a role, or we can offer uh, both, both ones. Depends on the patient and his preference. OK. Here's an important clinical question. Uh, which valve, uh, mechanical or tissue valve, is superior for end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis? Uh, previously, in the AHA guidelines in 1998, me mechanical processes have been suggested on in, in patients with uh, end-stage disease on dialysis, merely because the fact that the accelerated tissue de degeneration tends to occur more in this subgroup. However, most recent AHA guidelines and updates, this is no longer a recommendation. So on reviewing the literature, there was no there is, no, uh, there is no randomized control trial addressing this question, but there are systemic reviews and meta-analysis and other prospective uh, and other retrospective studies that shows there is no significant uh, difference in survival between mechanical and tissue valve in end-stage renal disease. Prosthetic valve-related complications in, in patients on dialysis were almost similar for both mechanical and tissue. However, uh, bleeding complication were a bit more commonly associated with mechanical valve. All factors uh, that determines the decision uh, for valve type in end-stage renal disease need to be considered. We have the age, the level of activity, patient choice. Uh, we know that the limited life expectancy in patients with end-stage renal disease, plus the fact that some modern tissue valve uh, has better durability, that makes the tissue valve degeneration to become more and more uncommon. So to, to conclude, uh, with implanting tissue valve in end-stage renal disease, it is possible to avoid the use of long-term anticoagulation and its associated complication. So therefore, surgeons should not hesitate to implant tissue valve in uh, end-stage renal disease. Okay, what about patients with, uh, with uh, childbearing age, women with childbearing age? Uh, what factors should be considered when choosing which aortic valve to be, to, uh, to be implanted in women of childbearing age. Tissue valves, uh, tissue valves uh, or tissue valve is known to degenerate quicker if placed in young group. This process of degeneration can be even accelerated by pregnancy itself. Mechanical valve, on the other hand, requires anticoagulation. This uh, may cause problems with uh, warfarin during pregnancy. Pulmonary autograft or aortic homograft can be used, but uh, would involve complex subsequent redo surgeries. Currently, there is no clear consensus on uh, the optimal type of valve prosthesis that would be placed in women of childbearing age. The risk of redo surgeries in tissue valve must be weighted against the risk of anticoagulation in mechanical valve. One strategy would be to consider uh, tissue until patient has completed her family and then replace it with mechanical valve uh, when it uh, degenerates. This is the uh, 2020 uh, recommendation regarding the choice of valve in women requiring AV, uh, uh, AVR before pregnancy, stating that it should be based on a uh, shared decision-making process after, after counting patient uh, value preferences and after discussing the risk of mechanical valve during pregnancy and the reduced durability of tissue valve in young women. Uh, some important uh, points to consider in managing women with mechanical valve uh, who got pregnant or planning to get uh, pregnant. It is critically important to fully explain the risk and benefit of all options to the patient and to her partner and should explain the necessity of receiving, uh, receiving therapeutic anticoagulation with frequent monitoring during the pregnancy period. Shared decision making uh, to choose anticoagulation strategy uh, for pregnancy. The patient should be informed that vitamin K antagonist like warfarin during pregnancy has the highest likelihood of abortion, prematurity, and stillbirth, and also in variopathy, particularly if it's taken during the first uh, trimester, and if warfarin dose exceeds five uh, milligrams per day, so it's dose dependent as well. 
warfarin, uh, however, is thought to be probably safe to be used during the week one to six and during the second and third trimester. Uh, heparin, on the other hand, does not cross the placenta and therefore does not cause empiropathy, but may induce bleeding at the uteroplacental junction. The HA recommendation strategy for anticoagulation, uh, for anticoagulating patient uh, with mechanical valve who is getting pregnant is as follows. Vitamin K antagonist or warfarin uh, during the, uh, the week one to six, the first half of the first trimester. Then IV unfractionated heparin during uh, week six to 12 where embryogenesis were most likely uh, to take place. Then after that, we resume warfarin for the next two trimesters until week 36. Uh, that is when IV heparin and unfractionated heparin is started from week uh, 36 or at least uh, one week before planned delivery. But just before vaginal delivery, uh, with six hours, heparin would be stopped and then it would be resumed six hours post placental separation if the bleeding is controlled. This is a HA anticoagulation recommendation we just spoke about in the previous slide. All right, uh, surgical technique. AVR with mechanical prosthesis has always been described as straightforward procedure. I'll try and uh, go through it uh, uh, quickly. Uh, I'll focus on few important points that should be, uh, that should require our attention. So historic, historically, aortic valve with higher uh, profile uh, higher profile meaning uh, this, the, the height of the structure uh, could be difficult to implant, particularly in small aortic root. This ball in a cage valve, uh, which has the highest profile, but uh, this is nowadays is almost non-existent. In, in these cases of high uh, of valves with high profile uh, replacement, a hockey stick aortotomy is used to unroll the aorta and expose the annulus. If a tilting disc is utilized, the major flow orifice needs to be oriented towards the greater curvature. This is the uh, tilting disc. It has two uh, orifice area. This is the major one and this is the minor one. The major one should be uh, oriented towards the greater curvature of the aorta, uh, but this is also, uh, I think, non-existed non anymore. Uh, Bileaflet valve uh, has much lower uh, profile and is simpler to implant. However, problems can still arise in the small aortic root. Nowadays, bileaflet are the most commonly utilized mechanical valves worldwide. All right, uh, aortic valve surgery can be performed through a median sternotomy with full or limited skin incision or using upper mini sternotomy. The distal uh, ascending aorta is normally cannulated in the, uh, directly in the usual fashion, uh, making sure there is no diffuse calcification or atherosclerosis involvement in the aorta. Uh, this is a cannulation snaring of the arterial cannula. Dual stage venous cannula is placed in the, into the right atrium. In case of combined mitral tricuspid valve procedure, then bicapal cannulation is needed. Different, my, different myocardial protection technique uh, depends on the surgeon and his usual practice. Here, retrograde cardioplegic cannula is placed in the uh, non coronary sinus and anti-grade cannula is placed in the aortic root as it shows here in this picture. Cardiopulmonary bypass is then initiated and cooling down to 28 degrees for moderate hypothermia. The aorta is clamped and 1000 milliliter of uh, cold blood cardioplegia solution is administered through the aortic root until myocardial activity ceases and ECG monitor reveals flat line. This is anti-grade cardioplegia, uh, cannula in the aortic root. Few points to mention here while administering the myocardial protection. Uh, one of these issues here is the LV distension, which we need to avoid. Uh, so successful, successful cardiac arrest with anti-grade cardioplegia in aortic root requires, valve, requires the valve to be relatively competent. If the valve is not competent and has significant AI, it can result in backflow of the blood uh, solution down into, the, into, the, uh, into a non-contracting LV cavity causing distension and possibly myocardial injury. Therefore, to avoid this problem, when the aortic valve is non-competent, uh, we'd start with cardioplegia and retrograde technique until complete standstill, uh, cardiac standstill. In addition to that, LV vent should be placed in the RSPV, the right superior pulmonary vein. 
and then extra doses of cardioplegia can later be given an augmented, uh, in, in augmented doses uh, directly in the coronary ostia after the aorta has already opened. Uh, this would show the uh, use of protective tip to protect the injuring the uh, coronary ostia, not uh, directly cannulating the coronary ostia like this to avoid injuring uh, the ostia or the coronary themselves. This is a LV vent through the right superior pulmonary vein. In case of difficulty cannulating the coronary sinus by a retrograde cannula, uh, to be safe, probably bicable cannulation should be performed and then retrograde cannula is placed under direct vision when we open the right atrium. Cardiac arrest with uh, a retrograde cardioplegia technique alone sometimes can be very slow. Uh, it takes a uh, long time to complete uh, standstill, especially if the heart is enlarged. If this is the case, aortotomy and aortotomy is done and anti-grade cardioplegia is directly uh, into the coronary arteries. RCA air embolism can happen during uh, AVR. To prevent this from happening, uh, at the end of the procedure, infusing of a warm blood retrograde, to, uh, retrograde for several minutes after the cross clamp is removed to minimize the risk of air bubbles in the aortic root uh, entering the right coronary artery. All right, one way of exposing the aortic valve, we are still approaching uh, the aortic valve. One way of exposing the aortic valve is by transverse aortotomy. We have two transfers and the oblique aortotomy. Low transverse incision is perhaps the most common, commonly used and preferred by many surgeons. There's epicardial fat outside the RVOT, as you can see here, uh, and the pulmonary artery may overlie our desired line of aortic incision. So they need to be dissected uh, free and retracted away from the uh, uh, aortotomy uh, site with uh, plagiated suture. Fine proline sutures, as you can see here, are uh, inserted superficially in the aortic wall on each side uh, of the proposed incision line. It should be 10 millimeter at least above the origin of RCA. Before making any incision, make sure you dissect the RCA and uh, recognize where the RCA origin is uh, to avoid uh, coming too close to RCA origin. Uh, after that cross clamp uh, of the aortic wall, uh, after the cross clamp, uh, cross clamping the aortic wall, incisors, uh, incision is, hap is happening between the two sutures and small leaflet retractor, retractor is introduced uh, for exposure. We need to be careful uh, when introducing the retractor uh, to avoid retractor injury, which can happen in old patients with post stenotic dilatation in which the aortic wall is dilated and so thin that aggressive retraction can cause tear of the wall of the aortic root, as you can see here in this diagram. Uh, to repair this complication, this might necessitate replacement of the ascending aorta or uh, patch repair of the aortic wall. Uh, under direct vision, the opening is then extended in, uh, on both sides. Care must be taken to stay approximately 10 millimeter above the aortic commissure. Alternatively, the incision can be extended obliquely upward and downward, uh, upward or downward, as you can uh, see here, converting it into an oblique incision if there was a tear. Another issue uh, to avoid, uh, as mentioned, during our autotomy is making an incision too close to the right coronary ostium. This can happen in, uh, in post-stenotic dilatation as well, seen in aortic stenosis and in congenital bicuspid aortic valve. This can distort the root, causing an upward displacement of the right coronary ostium. This uh, can make transverse aortotomy too close and might be impinging on the right coronary ostium. So we need to take our time to identify the origin of the right coronary artery before and while opening the aorta. You should keep this in mind. Um, other technique of exposing uh, the valve via oblique aortotomy or hockey stick incision. As you can see here, it starts high on the medial aspect of the aorta and then continue diagonally down on into the non-coronary sinus, uh, stopping at 10 millimeter at least above the aortic annulus. This incision is particularly useful in patients with small aortic roots. After aortotomy is exposed, 
after the autotomy and exposure of the, valve, of the valve, we can look at the different pathological morphologies. Here you can see the degenerative valve with lipocalcification on the leaflets, on the aortic leaflets, and then congenital bicuspid uh, valve, and also fused uh, commissure in rheumatic heart disease. And here, this is a regurgitant aortic valve. All right, the steps of uh, aortic valve replacement. Uh, it starts with excising uh, the valve and then debridement of any calcium particles, sizing the annulus for proper prosthesis, suture insertion into the annulus and into the sewing ring, then seating uh, the valve to snag it into the annulus, and finally closing the incision. Excision starts uh, using scissors, leaving one to two millimeter margin at the annulus. After the calcification uh, are crushed by rongeurs, uh, they are gently milk milked away or excised. However, the excision should be uh, limited uh, not to get too close to the annulus and leave little tissue to hold the suture securely. Therefore, we can leave a margin of uh, valve leaflet behind if it's necessary. Here, care must be taken not to allow calcium particle to fall into LV cavity, as this can result in systemic embolization and would stroke the patient after surgery. Normally, surgical assistant would hold a big sucker with, uh, without the tip and uh, would be uh, doing some suction on all the debris as the valve is being excised. But here, a folded segment or a wet sponge or wet gauze might be placed in the LV after the valve is excised and before the before removal of any calcium from the aortic annulus. And then uh, calcium debris fall into the sponge instead of being lost in the LV cavity. The LV cavity afterward is uh, will be flushed and irrigated well, and sponge is then removed at last. To protect uh, coronary from calcium particle embolization, as uh, we remove the uh, calcium particle, Ostia should be temporarily occluded with a swab or with the tip of the suction head. This, these precautions are, are useful in protecting the left coronary ostium, as the right coronary ostium is less likely to be exposed to calcium particle. And this is mainly because it's anti in anterior position and because it's often covered by the retractor, by the valve retractor. Another complication to avoid is the detachment of the anterior mitral valve leaflet from its annulus which can happen because of the aortic mitral continuity um, during excision of the aortic leaflet and also during the removal of calcium, uh, especially in the area near the left coronary cusp and non-coronary cusp. I'll show you a picture later. Uh, if this happens, the anterior mitral valve leaflet must be reattached to its annulus by interrupted plagiated suture, incorporating the torn edge to mitral valve, uh, of the mitral valve to the annulus. Also, another complication is annular weakness that can happen with aggressive pulling of calcium from the annulus. This might occasionally weaken the area and result in perforation. So weakened area must be recognized and uh, reapproximated with plagiated suture, as you can see here on this diagram. It is important to understand the surgical anatomy of the aortic valve to avoid commonly injured structure uh, during aortic valve surgery. This is a cross section of the heart. This is posterior, this is anterior. This is the mitral valve on the left side. This is the tricuspid valve on the right side. This is the aorta with the three leaflets. This is the most anterior part is the uh, pulmonary artery, uh, the trunk of the pulmonary artery. This is the left coronary sinus with the left uh, main artery, then the left circumflex and the LAD is going this way. Uh, this is the right coronary artery with the right, you see the right coronary uh, artery, uh, how far it is from the uh, incision line. This is a non-coronary sinus. This is the posterior mitral valve leaflet, and this is part of the anterior mitral valve leaflet as part of the aortic mitral uh, continuity. And if you can see here, the dashed line here, uh, this, would, uh, this would be the interventricular septum here, dividing the left from the right uh, ventricles. Uh, the upper part of the interventricular septum is the membranous part, and then uh, running through that is the conduction system. Uh, so the structures at risk during aortic valve surgery we have is number one, the aortic the anterior mitral valve leaflet, which is beneath the nun and the left uh, coronary cusp in this area. And the membrane, is, uh, membrane septum is beneath the nun 
and the right coronary uh, cusp. Beneath this is the bundle, where it's beneath the commissure between the, also this area, none and the right. Finally, we have more obvious structures, the right and left coronary ostia that easily to get injured. All right, sizing aort aortic uh, prosthesis. The valve chosen for replacement must fit properly in the, into the annulus. We have three simple sutures are inserted in the annulus, one near each commissure, as you see here. So by uh, applying traction, the aortic orifice can be exposed better. Attraction sutures can also be placed in the nadir of the annulus in between the commissures for more optimal exposure and easier sizing. Different sizes of obturators are then fitted into the annulus one by one, starting with the smallest, until we get the correct, correct size prosthesis that can fit snugly into the annulus. Uh, we should aim for a proper fit, not too loose and not too tight. Too loose meaning the patient is not getting the largest possible uh, prosthesis, which has the most optimal hemodynamic. Too tight, on the other hand, poses difficulty, difficulty on seating the valve. Oversizing uh, the valve as well can disturb the annulus and make it very difficult to close the aortotomy. Right, technique for suture insertion. Uh, the valve is sewn into position via interrupted sutures. Normally we, we would use um, uh, sutures like 2O Tychron, fidgeted suture with double needles. Uh, deep bites into the annulus is taken. The suture ends are then held and fixed in correct, in correct order into an organizing uh, ring or organizer. Once, uh, once all, uh, all annular sutures are placed, uh, they will be passed through the sewing ring in the same order, either singly or in vertical mattress technique. Alternative, alternatively, this can be done in one step, annular bite, then pass through the sewing ring immediately. Uh, one technique to facilitate exposure uh, when taking the bites is by pulling on the previously placed suture to bring out the tissue so you can take a good bite uh, in the next place, as it shows here. This is done by the main surgeon. Uh, suture security and what it means. Uh, all sutures must be individually checked and tested to make sure they are secured and, and will not cut through. This is the case if the bite is, uh, if the bite includes only small rim of the annulus, it would easily uh, cut through. If the sutures appear to be insecure, then we either remove, remove it or convert it into a figure of eight stitch and then pass it as it shows here. This is a figure of eight. This is just a single suture. This is a superficial suture that can easily be cut off. Uh, this is just a regular suture. Normally we use splitted sutures as they add security, especially with, uh, especially when the annulus is calcified or too friable uh, to hold sutures. We have two different techniques and techniques of interrupting sutures. You have the everting suture technique where the plidgets are lying above the annulus. This technique would place the valve in the in an intra-annular position, reducing the effective orifice area of the annulus. Uh, like this, it will be inter-annular, in between the annulus, uh, with lower effective orifice uh, area, allowing smaller valve to be implanted. The other technique is the non-everting uh, non suture technique, where the plegets will remain sub-annular, like this. This would uh, place the valve in a supra-annular position. This has an increased effective orifice area of the annulus and also allowing larger valve to be implanted and also adds, adds better security and satisfactory buttress effect. If uh, plegets are uh, utilized with uh, disc valve, the surgeon must then ensure that no plegets interferes with the normal movement of the disc. Also, if the suture breaks while being tied, then the loose plegets uh, must be retrieved immediately. In this case, even if the prosthesis often must be removed, then that's the case. Remove the uh, prosthesis in order to locate 
and remove the pledges from the left ventricle. Okay, after the after all annular sutures uh, are taken, they, they can now be inserted into the sewing ring in horizontal mattress fashion. One benefit of using the pledges, uh, pledges routinely is that it has markedly reduced the occurrence of paravagal leaks, which is a good thing. Heart block is another uh, uh, bad complication uh, that can happen if deeply placed sutures near the non-coronary and the right coronary annulus, as we saw previously in the previous, pre, uh, previous uh, slides. This can injure the conduction, uh, conduction system, leading to various forms of heart block, as you can see it here in the uh, diagram. And these deep bites can hit the conduction uh, apparatus. Uh, this complication can easily happen if there is massive calcification extending into uh, the ventricular septum and also if there is infective endocarditis with friable tissue. So um, temporary pacing wire in the RV is recommended for all patients undergoing aortic valve surgery. If the patient is still in complete heart block at the, at the time of completion of surgery, then temporary art, uh, arterial wires should also be placed to allow AV sequential pacing. Permanent pacemaker, however, might need to be implanted before the patient is discharged if the AV conduction has not yet uh, been, been re-established. Another dangerous complication is the injury to the left coronary artery. Calcification uh, and deformities can always obscure the suture placement uh, in the aortic annulus in a way that deep sutures placed near the left coronary, coronary annulus, annulus might puncture the left main. And this indeed is a very grave error. All precautions must be taken to avoid this occurrence. To, to prevent myocardial ischemia, the suture must be immediately removed. And if the integrity structural or functional integrity of left main uh, is in any way jeopardized, then uh, coronary artery bypass grafting to all of its major branch must be performed. Suture placement in the sewing uh, ring, suture needles are passed through the prosthetic sewing ring from below upward with the needle exiting at the exactly mid uh, junction uh, in the sewing ring. The suture knots should face away from the orifice of the mechanical valve to prevent contact with the disc or leaflet. When all sutures have been placed in the sewing ring, the prosthesis is gently lowered and fitted snugly in the, into the annulus Many surgeon would rinse the sutures with saline to lubricate, and uh, so the suture uh, can be uh, so it can be pulled through the sewing ring more smoothly. One of the tissues with uh, one of the issues when uh, seating the valve is when the ST junction, the sinus tubular junction, is narrow, narrower than the aortic annulus. This is sinus tubular junction which is narrower than the uh, aortic annulus, uh, which makes it, uh, which makes the right, uh, right size valve uh, to be too large to pass through it. In this situation, uh, what we can do, the holder is removed, and then the prosthetic valve is then turned on sideways and then lowered and seated safely into the aortic annulus as it shows uh, in the diagram here. It is also very important to ensure that there is no redundant tissue, no fragments, no calcium, no subannular pledges are protruding out of uh, out and uh, preventing satisfactory opening and closing of the valve. Also important to ensure normal valve function and any obstructing element uh, to be removed before final anchoring of the valve. After satisfactory seating, the sutures are uh, then tied down securely and cut short. It is important to know that when tying valve sutures, the direction should be always be parallel to the curve of the sewing ring, as it shows here. If this is a, uh, a sewing ring, uh, it should be parallel to it, not crossing like this in this uh, diagram. Tying down across the prosthetic uh, leaflet might uh, traumatize the prosthesis through contact with the, uh, with the suture material or with the surgeon, surgeon uh, fingertip, especially with um, tissue leaflets. 
sutures when uh, tied must cut short. Long suture ends uh, normally can protrude, protrude inside the valve orifice, interfering with normal closure of the mechanical valve. One also need to check the uh, prosthetic function and verify unobstructed opening and closing of mechanical valve. All right, now we come to close the after seating and making sure uh, all the sutures are cut short, uh, aortotomy closure. The aortotomy closure is usually accomplished with continuous 4-0 proline suture in double layer manner, starting at each end of the incision. Suture is then tied uh, to each other anteriorly, as it shows here. To avoid bleeding from the ends of aortotomy, this can be prevented to some extent by, uh, by the following technique, by uh, suturing back, taking few bites uh, of the normal unincised aortic wall, and then continuing forward along the incision. Or simply you can just uh, use plagiated uh, sutures at each end. Air embolism uh, to the aortic, uh, to the coronary arteries, particularly uh, right coronary artery, probably uh, does occur during de-airing of the LV. All preventive precautions should be taken to avoid this complication. First, we have the pump uh, flow can be reduced, and then RCA is temporarily occluded with digital pressure. Then the aorta is partially unclamped, so the backflow would flush all the air trapped in the aortic root to flow out from the aortotomy incision. Also, aortic root vent with high suction to continuously remove any bubbles ejected as the heart is filled. And of course, ventilation uh, would be started. After a complete de-airing, the vent needle is removed and the vent uh, suture is tied down. Friable and weak aortic wall uh, might require placement of additional uh, reinforcing plagiated suture, especially if the, if the aortic wall has been denuded of its adventitia or become so thin-walled. In this case, what we can do is uh, aortotomy suture line can be reinforced with strips of autologous pericardium. In case of oblique aortotomy closure, the closure in this case uh, would start before valve is seated. You can start uh, doing the closure by starting at the inferior extent of the opening, well into the non coronary sinus and tied, and then suture, uh, uh, suture line uh, then is continued for uh, five to six bytes and then is left loose. Prosthesis then can be seated and valve sutures can be securely tied. And then after that, orthotomy closure, uh, uh, you can go back to orthotomy closure and tighten, uh, tighten it with use of nerve hook and then continue, continue until it's complete. Okay. All right. Now we've finished with the surgical technique. Uh, we've replaced the valve. Uh, we will go over some circumstances that can happen post-operatively. I would like to uh, talk about patient prosthesis mismatch, what that means. Uh, simply, there is a mismatch between two things. We have the patient and the prosthetic valve. On one hand, we have the patient body service area that requires and demands specific cardiac output. On the other hand, we have prosthetic valve uh, with a specific size and specific effective orifice area. Okay, what is the effective orifice area? Effective orifice area is a flow dependent, dependent parameter calculated from continuity equation by Doppler echo. This is uh, effective orifice area is utilized to assist the prosthesis prosthetic valve function. This is different than the anatomic or geometric valve area that is determined by direct denilation, like by planimetry or uh, cardiac CT. This is the anatomic uh, orifice area and this is the effective orifice area. Effective orifice area is more flow dependent. It is also not equal to prosthetic valve size. It is worth mentioning here this is a mechanical valve. This is tissue valve. Uh, the valve size for mechanical valve, uh, the valve size for mechanical valves uh, refers to the external diameter, to the external diameter of the prosthesis. This one, uh, the swing ring diameter. Whereas in uh, the valve size in stinted valves refers to the internal diameter of the stint, the stint diameter. So you can see effective orifice area is always smaller than the valve size in all types. 
So to, to define uh, patient procedures mismatch, patient procedures mismatch can happen when the effective orifice area of an implanted prosthesis is too small relative, uh, relative to the patient's body surface area. Um, uh, patient prosthesis mismatch can be classified uh, by another parameter called the indexed effective orifice area. This index of effective orifice area is derived as this equation uh, shows here, effective orifice area over the body surface area. And the normal index effective area is more than 1.2. This is what we are aiming. Anything that is above 1.2, that is good uh, for our valve. Anything that is less than uh, 0 0.8 is considered patient prosthesis mismatch. This table right here uh, is usually provided by each company and is customized for from the company to each of their prosthetic valve. It's supposed to help us uh, selecting the proper valve size with the most optimal effective orifice area possible and to prevent uh, patient procedures mismatch, of course. You see on the white axis here, this is a body surface area ranging from small to large body surface area. And then on the X axis here is the uh, prosthetic size uh, label. For example, for a patient of a body surface area 1.6, like example for he here, 1.6, we aim to fit the largest size that is surgically possible, which would fall in the green, green zone. Like for example, if we come here, anything in the green zone, the largest uh, possible, we can, we can implant it. We aim for the largest, if not, then the smallest and so forth. So if we can, uh, uh, for example, fit 25, uh, 25 or 23, uh, the, the biggest that can fit. And then uh, we should avoid uh, small sizes as we go uh, here, avoid this uh, yellow and red uh, zones. Uh, the red zones, uh, the red zone otherwise is, uh, is, refer is referring to patient procedures mismatch. If we end up with a valve and then the index effective orifice area tend to be in this zone, then we just defeated the whole purpose of aortic valve replacement we ended up with aortic stenosis. Uh, this chart demonstrates the comparison of effective orifice area among different types of valves with different sizes. You can see here we have St. Jude, ATS, both are mechanical and then carbomedics. Uh, Par Paramount mosaic are the uh, uh, tissue. You can, you can notice uh, St. Jude uh, Regent has the largest effective orifice area among other types of valve in all sizes. Here, St. Uh, Jude Regent has 1.9, is the highest in all, and then two highest in all uh, in this uh, size, and in uh, size 23, it's also the highest. This table demonstrates the same thing. St. Jude Mechanical has the highest uh, effective orifice area. Among this column, 1.7 is, uh, is the highest. And in this column, 2 is the highest. 2.5 is the highest here, 2.6 uh, St. Jude. And then followed by uh, Edward. And then finally with Top Hat. This is just to show you a comparison of how important the effective orifice area is when choosing uh, the proper valve. Another parameter is important, which is the peak aortic gradient. Uh, measured by millimeter mercury through uh, prosthetic valve is uh, here the optimal peak gradient is the lowest possible of course you can see here also saint jude ats carbomeric and the paramount mosaic you can, we are aiming for the lowest uh, peak gradient saint jude also has the lowest gradient in all among all valves in all sizes another uh, diagram for uh, peak aortic gradient through prosthetic valve showing the same thing, superiority of St. Jude Regent and showing lower peak aortic gradient. All right. In case of acute mechanical uh, valve thrombosis, the American Heart Association recommendation are still the same. This is the recommendation uh, for diagnosis here. And uh, uh, of acute mechanical valve thrombosis. And this is the recommendation of uh, uh, intervention if the diagnosis is confirmed. So all suspected uh, cases should go for an urgent echo, TEE, and other imaging modality to assess three things, uh, valve function, leaflet motion, and extent 
of thrombosis. This is this will be a class one A uh, recommendation, uh, cl class one B uh, recommendation. Uh, if the patient is uh, has a confirmed diagnosis, who present with obstructive valve symptoms and shortness of breath, then he should go for an urgent intervention, whether it's a low dose fibrinolytic or emergency uh, surgery to remove the clot. This is also class one uh, B. This table right here uh, shows the factors considered for proper intervention, including surgical risk, surgical experience, history of recurrent thrombosis, and contraindication of fibrin fibrinolytics, clinical picture and extent of the thrombus. So if uh, we have a patient with shortness of breath in NEHA class three to four with large thrombus burden, then we should go for emergency surgery. And if we have a patient who has a shortness of breath NEHA class two or less with small uh, clot burden, then we should go for fibrinolytics. Last slide. Uh, uh, Follow-up after AVR. Ideally, all patients have uh, an echo pre-discharge, and this is the assist valve function, uh, LV function, and if there is any small paravalvular leak or pericardial uh, effusion, uh, this can serve as a baseline for future uh, uh, follow-ups. Routine outpatient follow-up compromises of two months, six months, and then yearly afterwards. It is important to mention here, uh, mechanical valves uh, do not require routine echo unless they develop new symptoms or a murmur, whereas patients with tissue valves, however, require an annual echo after five years to identify any evidence of structural valve uh, deterioration. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Abdul Badia. Uh, may Dr. Mohammed Rifaq, if, if you have comment or uh, something to add. MashaAllah, uh... Allah Thank you, uh, Abdul Badia, for this uh, detailed description for the mechanical valve and a few other topics. Um, um, small comment. Our Haji had anticoagulation during the pregnancy. And if you follow the guidelines, um, it depends on the comedy level and how you break them within the first, second, or th uh, third trimester. Um, but we have to be you know, a little bit detailed from the uh, But it ends that the um, small aortic root and the way to enlarge it. So and one of the way to do the enlargement is to perform a ventral operation. Um, that's the extreme option. Um, طبعاً the other alignment option غير ال 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 hook stick لما تعمل ال 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 an extension of the incision itself whether through a monogen a brush or a nix or a nuns um, this another option we didn't really address in here in detail um, other than that um, the last topic which uh, the patient prosthesis mismatch which is basically where the prosthesis do not meet the body demand or the requirement and it needed to be um, replaced because you didn't fix the problem by creating another problem. If the patient have a stenosis and you give him a small prosthesis, he gonna still have the same symptoms, he gonna still have the same problem. And this is why we do the measurement and why we look at the effective orifice area index and we replace the, um, the appropriate size valve. Um, I think that's it. MashaAllah, you did a fantastic job. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad, for your support. Um, um, any other question? Uh, any question from the audience? Or... Thank you, Abdel Badia. Haytham al Bar with you. Actually, uh, you give me a quick review of what I already been. You know, I just finished the exam, so really fantastic uh, lecture. And uh, you sum up everything in, in this lecture. Thank you. For me, no question. I just want to thank you verbally as well. Uh, thank you, Azim. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Much appreciated. Uh, I have a small question or, or comment, uh, if you allow me. Uh, while tying the the valve uh, in place uh, so is there any uh, preferred way to tie this or i i mean order to tie uh, the sutures like starting from certain area or, or I, has not 
I think I would direct this question to Dr. Muhammad uh, Rafai. Well, it's it's a personal preference, yani. It's it's nothing uh, significant. Some people prefer to start from underneath the left common, uh, under the uh, left uh, coronary to see the valve, and you can see expose the area, and you make sure that your valve is is well seated under that area. Um, some people just start with the commissures to see the valve down. It depends on the valve. It depends on the personal preference. Uh, personally, I would start underneath the left coronary ostium uh, and go all the way clockwise. Um, but it doesn't really make a big difference as long as you have a well-seated valve. Okay. Uh, Doctor, how about in patients with, with aortic regurg? Uh, do you usually go directly with retrograde or you just uh, open and uh, do a direct... Uh, Osteal uh, bleed here. With the retrograde and open and give direct osteo. To oh, give okay. the best protection possible. Oh, okay. Um, any other question? Same, same your question, Tessa. I, I ask it uh, the same question to multiple. You know, as, as Dr. Muhammad Rifai said, it is, uh, it's about uh, preference of, of the surgeon. Many of them, they will start, as he said, from the left. <clears throat> then they will go for the right coronary, then non-coronary. Uh, then they will go uh, to finish all the suture. You can tie down by just tying or use cornut, uh, cornut as well device. It's been used in multiple centers. They use it a lot. Uh, in some centers, not all, not all the centers. Okay. Uh, so how, how about uh, in case of you have small uh, annulus, can we tilt, um, uh, I've read that you know, we can tilt the, uh, the valve, the mechanical valve toward the greater curvature. Uh, a little bit. I mean, what, one of the tricks, uh, uh, is this uh, really a good practice, uh, Dr. Fai, or? Uh... Well, it's, it's uh, not a matter of a good practice or not. It's, it's an option, okay? You can go with it and you tilt a bit toward the area of the non-coronary and you tie your suture over there. Actually, this way, um, in Toronto General Hospital, um, one of the surgeons over there, he used this technique and I saw it with him doing this technique over there uh, and it is a valid option there is nothing wrong with that but having said that you need to make sure that you have a good tissue aorta so when you do your suture and everything it doesn't just tear apart right uh, and if you do want to really expand your incision or you are limited with that option and you want to just use that as an option yes it's it's a valid thing but as i mentioned like uh, we have multiple options um, we can do, uh, we can explore, we can enlarge the, the, uh, the root, we can replace the whole root as another option, and tilting the valve is still a valid option you can do. But you need to, need, you need to know how to do it. That's a fact. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, so, uh, any more question or uh, we conclude? Okay, thank you, Abdel Badir. It's a very comprehensive uh, lecture. Thank you, Dr. Rifai, for uh, joining us. Um, so uh, by that, we conclude uh, today's uh, activity, and inshallah, we'll see you guys uh, next week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much.